I'm going to, I'm going to record it, and then we'll stop when we get to, get to the comments. Okay, so uh, what I thought we would talk about today is the customer analysis. Uh, oops, excuse me, just happened to be in the wrong place. There we go. We're going to talk talk about to customer analysis and targeting new customers. Um, and a uh, couple couple of slides just as a reminder, um, and then we'll, we'll get get right into it. Um, and I'm not sure why I put this here. I think it was for an adaptation. But it's interesting to look at, I think, because it's a question of how do small businesses make wealth? And we've talked about this before, but I don't know if I've shown you, have I shown you this, this uh, infographic before? No. No? Okay. So basically, these are the people who uh, fit into the entrepreneurial kind of profile. They're conservative, uh, very, very uh, smart with, with money, um, and smart enough to be able to, to handle it. Uh, they have a family spousal support, very strong. I mentioned this before, um, and of course, a, a really strong work ethic. They they have a, a competency there, or their company has a competency that is matched with the market, um, and of course, that goes through our value diagram in terms of that shows up as service and also as quality. And then um, when you have the right image and the price is right, then you can create niche leadership. And niche leadership is created with these marketing drivers, which is marketing share, uh, the PIMS principles, which we talked about last time, um, the 22 immutable laws of marketing, which uh, I don't think we've talked about in a while. Um, uh, we'll, we'll bring them back up, but one of them has to do with uh, market leadership and being one, two, or three, as PIMS does, so that one supports the other. And then Warren Buffett's uh, moat strategy is the, the way that you protect your business. And of course, I call that positioning and that's what creates the, the niche leadership. And of course, we've already discussed this. Here's the marketing plan cycle that goes around and around. And so we're gonna focus on customers today. The customer analysis gives us an opportunity to do the targeting. Uh, and then it also feeds into competencies as to where we fit in that marketplace. So we're going to dig into customers. Um, first of all, there are different kinds of businesses. And so you've got uh, the kind of business that sells to what's called consumers. And um, those are folks that sell consumer items. And then you've got business to business. So, you know, we've got one of each of you today, Edgar is uh, doing a consumer type business at a restaurant. And of course, Christian is uh, doing business with businesses. And so you're business to business. Now there's, well, uh, the principles are similar, um, but there are some differences that, that we'll talk about as we go through here. Typically, um, people who, who make things, either a sandwich or a taco, uh, or who do services like picking up, you know, waste, um, uh, will go potentially to the internet and the consumer, uh, or they'll go to a wholesaler, distributor, and then a retailer, and finally a consumer. And so uh, that's sort of the way it is broken down today. You do have an issue with this wholesaler distributor issue, if in some industries, and we won't spend too much time on that, um, well, I suppose that because you're, you're both of you are, in a sense, buying. So if you're buying from a food uh, uh, vendor, that's probably a distributor of that food. So you're buying there, but you're not really selling that. You're not marketing through a distributor. Uh, and then, of course, Christian, you're also buying things potentially from a distributor, but um, uh, and you're buying direct because it's business to business. But this is really the marketing side, and that is that there used to be the distributor, but of course, as you know, that's been uh, largely supplanted by people like like uh, Amazon, where you can now just sell directly, go right around the distributor to the retailer, which is Amazon in that case, uh, or the business, and so to the internet and to, to the business. So just keep in mind there are those two different kinds. So what do we need to, to, 
What do we need to analyze when we look at customers? We've talked about a couple of these things, and uh, we're going to dig in deeper in, in, in today to some of them. Uh, and some we've already been through. Uh, first is the contribution to sales. We're going to talk about that in terms of what customers contribute to what kinds of sales and what kind of business in your business. And of course, then the contribution margin, that's how much money does each customer generate uh, in margin dollars. So um, that's important because the big kahuna uh, may get better prices from you and may not generate as much as much uh, profit uh, or margin. As you, and a lot of times when we do projections, we make mistakes by assuming that you, you take your bottom line, uh, well, you're not your bottom bottom line, but your margin line uh, after you subtract your cost of goods sold and you just apply that across the board to everybody in, who in say a customer um, analysis. And then if you do, do do that and you keep track of the individual consumers, um, pricing, then you can, you'll identify that it's very, very often the case that the really large customers, uh, you have a lower contribution margin or a lower gross margin. And so that's why it's important to look at that. There are not very many businesses that have the wherewithal to pull this off, uh, because you have to keep your do cost analysis at the customer level. And, and unless you do that, you, you can't calculate it. Uh, of course, that's the kind of the reverse of the cost of sales. And so that's, uh, well, from an accounting perspective, the cost of sales, but there's also another cost of sales. And that is um, how much does it cost to actually achieve the sale because of the marketing? And that's kind of what I meant in this particular case. And that is that uh, it may be costly to go get a really big customer um, in order to be able to do business. Uh, John used to have to fly to China in order to, you know, cl close deals in order to figure out the cost because he had to manufacture it. So the, the cost to do that is a whole lot different than, you know, taking it off the shelf and, and just, you know, reselling it. Um, the, the cost of delivery or distribution, and, and of course, that depend, it used to depend on well, how far away were they um, was it FOB, freight FOB, uh, so they paid it and it didn't matter where you were, or in order to be competitive, do you, did you need to um, reimburse them or give them a lower price to be competitive with a local, say, distribution house or a local manufacturer? Um, uh, of course, there's business to business, which I've already um, mentioned, that's a little bit different. We take a, we want to know, uh, what industries and sub-industries are contributing to your overall customer business as well? Because if we don't, then we're not, we're, we're not able to identify where that target market really is. Um, and then of course, obviously a geographic review, we've talked about that, and there are more. Um, my point in kind of throwing this up is that when people say customer analysis, the standard answer is, oh, well, we know our customers. Well, no, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find that most, most business folks do not know their customers. Uh, they might know uh, a few people. They might, you know, they might think that they know about them. Um, but I can assure you that, you know, you may understand the kind of business you're doing with a customer. But number one, you don't necessarily know uh, the percentage of, say, the sub industry that's contributing to your business. Um, I've never, ever run into a business that did that. Now, I have run into businesses where they know that they do business with a man the manufacturing sector. They do business with the retail sector. They do business with oh, a financial sector. They, you know, crazy. It's so different. And, you know, it's sort of like, well, we have these kinds of business. We know that, that they're that way. Sometimes they'll even have a sort of a division because they'll sell to those diverse industries in a different way. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, they don't know much more than that. And that's about as far as that goes. So these are some things to keep in mind about it. 
You can't do all of these things at once in a business. It's hard to do these things. Uh, and the reason is, is that people don't keep the numbers at the proper uh, detail level in order to be able to come up with these numbers. Okay, some of the other things uh, that you want to know about customers. Uh, and you can see there are lots of questions. Um, you know, and it doesn't matter what they think of, about you and your, your businesses. You know, are, are they all the same? Well, no, they're not all the same at all. Um, uh, you know, you, do you know how they make decisions and how they've picked you over competitors? And then uh, what do you tell them that they get from you? What is the value that you give to them? Now, good salespeople kind of intuitively do that and understand it. The question is, do you measure that? And if you don't measure that, then as you grow a little bit, how do you really ever know um, some of these things? What is the customer life cycle? You know, it's, it's really interesting to see, and I've had it said to me many, many times, um, uh, well, you know, it's about the same. We do the same amount of business each, each year or each month. And then you take it and you spread it all out and you break it out by industry or by customer type. And then you find out, no, no there's seasonality to almost every one of these things. Um, putting, putting, um, putting everybody in the same bucket rarely works in terms of understanding them as a whole. Uh, it's like averages never work. And you've heard me use use this uh, example before, but um, uh, you you know you're you're on a scout troop. You've got you know three foot tall scouts. You see there's a, a troop next to you, and you say to the scout master, um, uh, how, "How what what's the average depth of the stream that we're about to cross?" And he says, "Oh, it's it's only two feet deep." And as you begin, you, you begin to cross, you realize because he gave you the average, it goes from one foot to four feet and all your, all your scouts drown. That's a big difference. That's a big, it's a, that's, that's the kind of, of um, conclusion that you, you, don't, you don't want to have. And why? It's because you used averages. Well, when you use averages with customers, you end up with the same kind of disaster. They have to be treated at least as cohort groups, or you just you just make those mistakes. Uh, there are a lot of times when you can't figure out what the problem of, of a particular business is, or they can't figure out the problem, and the reason is they haven't got enough data collection for you to be able to find out the problem. And if they're using averages, it's they're 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 thinking to themselves, well, well, the stream is three feet deep. And we just don't understand why we can't uh, seem to uh, get any traction with our two foot five inch uh, stilts or whatever the case may be. So that's where mistakes come from is by not having enough data. So when you ask yourself, gee, you know, can we afford to keep all keep track of all of these numbers? The answer is, well, it just kind of depends on number one. Do you want to figure out the problems or not? Number two, do you want to maximize your profit if, if you've got it? or not? And the answer usually is, well, we, we would like to, we would like to have both of those. Um, okay, um, so a couple of other things, if then over on the right hand side, you can see there's just a whole bunch, I won't read them all, but there are a whole bunch of things that we want to know about. Um, I'll just pull up one or two, what are their expectations? You know, do you ever ask them? Um, did, when, when you sell them something, was it exactly what they wanted? It's sort of like, you know, an exit survey. You, you use some software uh, and uh, you're roused about in with some, something and then you, you're ready to leave and then it pops up and it says, tell us about your experience. They want to know, you know, did you find what you were looking for and what were your expectations? So those are the kinds of things that we want to know. And then we want to set up feedback systems that deliver that information so that we can figure it out. Okay, so we're going to just sort of jump into something sort of sort of fun. I've done this. Uh, a couple of you may have seen some of these, but what this uh, what this is is just simply two spreadsheets, and this is how how we are going to take a look at the uh, Pareto principle or the 
the rule for customers. So you have to set up your data and you need to be able to have a certain amount of information. So the way this is set up, these are two different ones, but you've got customer address, city, state, zip. So you've got all of that. What was the revenue? What was the margin on, say, if you have a category of merchandise or a category of services, you want to know these two items for that category for each customer. So you can see we've got category one through whatever. So if you sell five categories of merchandise, you want to know the revenue and the margin of each one of those so that you can then determine whether or not there's a difference by customer. And then, of course, if you're putting in the type of customer, as we just talked about, you may have different industries, you may have different um, um, lifestyle types, whatever type of customer you want to keep a sheet on this. Actually, there should be a column. You'd sort on that and then you total them out and you would see how they're different. So another another way I like to look at it, and I'm going to give you an example on this, is to be able to take a look at how much revenue your customers um, deliver to you based on the size of the, of the revenue. So again, customer, address, city, state, or just customer. But you want here revenue, and then you look at the cumulative revenue, and cumulative is, you know, row one, two, three, four, five, six. Then you calculate the percentage of the revenue of this of the revenue and then the percentage of the cumulative revenue that should go down. And so when you do that, you end up with something like this. So here we've got the customer. Here we have them and they're sorted by the largest revenue. So the first thing we do is we build a very simple spreadsheet. We just we just copy the top line over to the first line. We calculate the percentage of that, and then we uh, we copy that number over here. The second line, though, is different from there on down because we're going to take this revenue, um, the top line and the second line, and add them together. And then we're going to calculate the percentage of the total of the two, and then we're going to add those as we go down this line so that we end up uh, determining the, well, the whole thing. So you can see here we've got revenue. Here's the, uh, the cumulative starting to go down this one. But that's 20% of the business. So there's the percentage of the, that revenue. And it's 20% of the total revenue. So this is a percent of this um, column and this is a percent of this column. As we do that, we see that this, the cumulative revenue goes up. And so we can calculate, we, we can just simply go down and, and grab a particular number that correlates to 20%. So in this case, you've got the first one is 20%, the second and the first are 39, and then the top three are 56, the top four is 70, the top five are 79%. It happens to be, if you count then, how many customers do you have? You got 100. Five, that's 20%. Son of a gun, 20% of your customers make up 80% of your business. Now, you might say, oh, okay, that just happened that way. It's different for everybody. Well, and that's true. But it's amazing how many times this happens. I mean, it's amazing. So here is the principle that we use. It's called the 80-20 rule or the Pareto. I think I spelled that wrong. Whoops. I looked it up even, but I still typed it wrong. You did spell it wrong. Yeah. Uh, the, Pareto, the Pareto principle. Um, oh, here it is. I spelled it right over here. Okay. The Pareto principle. It states that for many outcomes, roughly 80% of the consequences come from 20% of the causes. In other, in other words, this is not something that is unique to customers. This is unique to the entire world. Oh, it's not unique. It's general for the entire world. Um, and, and, and of course, the 80-20 rule is, is what a lot of people call it. It's also called the law of the vital few or the principle of factor sparsity. So what this means over here is, and this is exactly what we did, if you've got 100,000, this is in pounds, the example I just happened to find is 100,000 pounds, that you've got 80% uh, of, of the donors uh, represent 20% of them, 
um, uh, 20% of the money and 20% of the donors represents 80% of the money. And so who are you going to target? You're going to target the ones that you've identified as the top 20% because you will get 80% of your revenue roughly from roughly 20% of the donors. So this is true just about everywhere. So here are a couple more. Um, many times you have the largest market share in a niche will have from 30 to 50% of the total business. The second one, the number two, will have half of the first one. The third will have half of the second one. Therefore, in a marketplace, each marketplace, that you will have the, everybody else from four on will, will have 30 to 50% left to split. So what you end up with is you end up with this Pareto type principle where the top 3%, the, th the top three will have 50% of the market. Now you might say, oh, they're all better. Well, they probably are better. But there's also this unusual economic kind of law that exists that causes this to happen. It's not all the time, but you wanna know if that's, that's causing it. Here's some other natural phenomena. 15% of all the players last year in, in a sport, I think this was baseball, produced 85% of the wins. The other 85% of the players created 15% of the wins. 20% of the ha of hazards account for 80% of the injuries. And therefore, if you are an insurance company, you're going to take a look at those 20 top 20%. So you see how if you understand this principle, it helps you focus on what you should be doing. Of 100 papers that are written, they only 25% of, say, of 100 papers that are written by 25 people, five authors will have contributed half of the papers. So when we start looking at um, content development on websites, you know, and we have talked about that with, with several of you. I know that this is the case because I know that that um, Pareto principle or, or in this case, Price's Law, which is a very similar one. I know that that exists. And I know that only about 20, 25% of the people will do the vast majority of the work. So apply this to Jordan Peterson, applied this to musicians. Uh, he was he was fairly harsh about it, as a matter of fact. And he was saying that, you know, those, those folks who are, um, uh, who, who like music and who think that they are going to make a living at it are most likely um, completely disjointed from reality. And why is that? Because, now this is from memory, I think this is about right. Something like, 50% of all the music is written by um, just 5% of the, of the population. Of the listening, if you listen to it, just one tenth of 1% of the writers create well over 50% of the listening time. In other words, if you're not in that one tenth of 1%, nobody will listen to your music. Almost nobody. And therefore, that's why he says, if you happen to be a musician or very creative, you need to figure out some way to make a living because the odds are so far against, so, so highly against you making any money that it's, it's not worth it. You have to be in the top one-tenth of 1% 1 in order to be successful. Now, if you're a plumber, that's a lot different. You probably only have to be, uh, probably 80% of the plumbers can make a living. And of course, that has to do with supply and demand. But you see how this Pareto principle really rolls through almost everything we do. And it can be and, and should be applied to business particularly where revenue and customer analysis is concerned. And you can do, look at your competitors sort of in, in the same way. Um, 
Finally, let's apply it to money. Everybody is upset about how, how the rich people have all the money. And in fact, if we look at this, uh, yes, the richest 20% have 82% of the money. Does this look strange to you after having seen the Pareto principle? No, it's normal. It's like everything else in life. Well, and then you go all the way down, the poorest 20% only have 1.4%. So it gets pretty, pretty bad on the bottom side, doesn't it? Why is that? Well, I don't know. You know, I, I, we've got a whole country, a whole world, um, and a whole lot of Marxists who are really trying to change this. Now, I'm not saying this is fair or not fair. I think you could probably argue that there's something in, unfair about it. The problem is, is if, if we are going to live in a society that is free, we are going to have the circumstance. And this is the way it is. And this is the way businesses are sorted out. Because let me tell you what, the successful, the ones who stay in business are the top 20% and everybody else is out of business. Okay. Now, I don't know why people can't get this through their heads. Um, but that's it, it. But it is, it's one of the, one of these facts that we can't really change. The only thing you could do to change the natural side is to impose an unnatural side. In other words, government will have to change this. Government will have to take it from the top and give it to the bottom in order to, to change what has been a natural phenomenon forever. And it, forget about money. Just talk about the people who produce things. You know, of, of your employees, you're going to find that the top 10% of your employers, employees, well, let's say the top 20% of your employees are going to do 80% of the, the valuable work. They all, they all get 40 hours of pay, but the ones who are really good are the ones who are generating most of the work. Now, the question is, do you pay them in a commensurate fashion? That's another whole thing. Um, I'm sure John will be interested in having that conversation. But when we talk about, you know, paying people for what they're worth, there's a whole new paradigm out there that we could consider. Okay, so when we take a look at these characteristics of the Pareto, when it's applied, we're gonna go back now to customers. We've got, we've got, we've looked at our customers, we've realized that um, uh, there's some ratio in there where some small percentage of customers are generating some much larger percentage of the total business. And I have, I've discovered after doing this many, many times for many different kinds of businesses that you do have a range. Most of the time it's right here, 80, 20. I would say you're with, you know, 74, five, six, seven, eight, um, uh, most of the time, or maybe 82%, but in a, in a narrow range that about 80% of the time <laughs> you fit right into this category, but occasionally, you have people who have five employees or five customers generating 95% of their business. What does this mean? Well, it means there's an extreme risk of revenue interruption because out of the top five, one or two leave and you've lost 30 or 40% of your business. This is a dangerous place to be in. And if you have a customer ratio like this, you're in danger. And you need to change that. Something's got to change. These big gorillas, as they're many times called, can again once they realize they've sort of got gotcha, you um, by the short hairs, then um, they can really push hard to ask for more freebie stuff or lower prices. And if you can't afford to lose them, the, you'll have to buckle under in some way, and then. And that's why we ask you to look at the margin by customer, because you need to know if you're giving away too much stuff to the big guys so that you can maintain, you know, your, the profit profile that you want. Okay, 90-10, well, that's this lower number of customers can indicate a need for more customers of the same size. And so, you know, if 10% of your customers are generating 90% of your business, 
then what you want to do is you, you, you want to, you know, maybe get rid of one or two of the big guys. Depends on the margins, right? If those guys' margins are lower, you may just say, we're going to raise your prices because we can't afford to have this. Com it's not you can't afford to have them. You can't afford this composition of customers. Well, I should say it differently. You have a higher risk when you have this kind of this kind of a, of a, of a, of a Pareto ratio, uh, and therefore you want to try to actively do something about it. Um, I like the strategy of getting more of those same kinds of customers at those volume levels. That's really hard to do, um, but that's that's a, a better goal than just getting rid of one or two of them to change the ratio. But if, in fact, you're losing money on one or two of them, that may be the thing that you do. Uh, in, in this normal one, that's kind of, you know, nothing to be alarmed of if you're in a range here. If you have a 70-30, now you have, you've got a, an interesting place because it's, it's a little bit safer for your revenue. Um, but you may not be stretching hard enough in order to get, to get more, more bigger business, too. And so you've got sort of the opposite effect. Maybe you're a little bit lazy. Now, there are times when it's natural. Um, when you sell um, lower price items to a lot of people, like say a restaurant, you're not going to have, um, you're not going to have these kinds of ratios. 80% of your, your customers, 20% of your customers probably won't provide 80%. Um, but if you're a, a, a family restaurant and a luncheon, a lunch restaurant, a place that people frequent on a regular basis, you may find that they come back enough to where that this, there is more of a Pareto principle than you expect. On a given day, that's not going to be the case, but on a given month, it might be because you've got the same group of customers coming back two or three times. Um, this is likely, um, it, this, this may happen with finer restaurants as well. So that's, that's the value that this brings. It's a real strategic value. Um, this is kind of the same thing we just talked about, but it just happens to be in a graphic form. So you can kind of see, see what that is. Uh, this is a similar thing, except we, we've added, uh, we've added potential. This is a hypothetical profit. You may not be making money with the gorillas. Uh, you may be just a little out of balance, and, but but over here you may be making a lot of money. By the way, this is not percentage of revenue. That's that's the number of customers. So you can kind of ignore that. Okay, so um, let's see how our time is doing. Okay, so let's see. I think what I'm going to do here is. Um, uh, unlike most times when I just go right up to the end. I think I want to open it up because we've, we've kind of had this, I think it's a reasonably large topic and something that uh, is, is a good edge. So let's just open it up and have a conversation um, just to, in, until we run out of things to talk about <laughs> or we're at 1.30. So um, Ed, good to see you. Uh, let's see, Edgar, did you raise your hand? I did actually earlier. I had a, a question when you, when you were talking about five, five, um, your high executive employees that, uh, kind of once they become like 90%, 90% of your productivity, um, if you, if you look at a business, could you say that that, that person could also be the the owner slash employee of his own company that without him, the company can fall apart. And if you don't catch that on time, you won't sure. know that until that person is disabled or something happens. Uh, sure. I, you, you could certainly include, <clears throat> include the owner in, in a small, especially a smaller company. Yeah. But I think, I think that's just something that's overlooked and, um, um, it, it's hard sometimes to tell. Because I th that particular number is um, creating, you know, say 10%, 20% create 80% of the value. That doesn't mean that they're, they're billing, you know, that 20% that of them are billing 80%, although it's possible that they're billing that much. 
and it doesn't mean that they're producing that much, in, say, if in a factory circumstance. Um, it's more like they contribute that much value to the entire company because they are a, um, a supervisor. They are a really, really good and trusted uh, um, um, controller. They, um, they have the ideas that the other people don't have and they're implemented and everybody benefits because of that. So, you know, there are lots of inputs. It's, it's a really hard thing to measure. And um, I guess the, the reason to think that through is just to be aware of it because there are people in your organization that are undercompensated because you don't think that way. I mean, we tend, we tend to, you know, small business people tend to say, well, gee, you know, that job is, is worth, you know, 30 bucks an hour and somebody's really good at it. So I'll pay him 31, 32, when really you may find that somebody ought to be getting $60, you know, if they're really contributing that much. And in this environment in particular, boy, you've got to identify the, the folks that are valuable and make sure that they are compensated so they don't get stolen. So, I have another. Ed, you guys have any any experience with that? Well, it's not only compensation; it's um, treating them with respect and including them as part of the team. I just got off a conversation with someone who's a very good financial person, but the owner she doesn't feel the owner treats her with respect. And um, it doesn't matter how much he pays her. Um, she doesn't feel like uh, she's fully engaged in the company and doing what she's supposed to do. So um, including people and making them feel like they're part of the team is really important. It, it 